trustees uh, take their seats, please. Yes, I'd like to call a special board meeting to order for Monday, June 16th, 2014. Um, looking uh, at the agenda in front of us, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Uh, seeing none. Oh, we do have, um, if I could just go back to order. Uh, we do have regrets from Trustee Turkstra, Trustee Petal, uh, and Trustee White. I do want to uh, indicate to anyone in the public that uh, if uh, you are interested in making presentations to before the Board of Trustees regarding the uh, education development charges policy review, you can do that after we have done the policy review document itself, um, uh, have a presentation on that behalf. Uh, I then would like to go to, uh, just to give uh, uh, everyone uh, some general comments and specific uh, comments to this purpose tonight. Uh, we are proposing to enact an education development charges bylaw, which is a jurisdiction-wide EDC bylaw that will apply to land in the city of Hamilton. The new bylaw is required because the current bylaw of the board is scheduled to expire on August the 30th uh, of this year. The board will be conducting two public meetings this evening as part of the process for passing the new bylaw. The first public meeting, which is now, will deal with a review of the current EDC policy of the board as reflected in its current bylaw. And the second public meeting, which will follow this one, will address the proposed bylaw that the board anticipates passing in August 2014. The Education Act, which is the legislation that governs EDCs, requires that the board convene these two public meetings before passing the actual new bylaw. The primary purpose of any district school board in implementing education development charges is to provide a source of funding for new school sites, which are required as a result of land development. These are not funded by a per pupil grant under the province's funding model. EDCs may be set at any level provided that the procedures set out in the regulation and required by the ministry are followed and only growth related net education land costs are recovered. And no more than 40% of the education land costs are recovered from non-residential development. The EDC calculation is based on new pu pupils that will be generated by housing units and other identified developments within the bylaw area for which building permits will be issued over the 15 year planning period and for which additional school accommodation is required. The staff of the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board, assisted by consultants, work through the background analysis, respecting growth project, uh, projections, pupil enrollment forecasts, determination of growth related pupil place requirements and site costing. The required EDC forms have been completed and submitted to the Ministry of Education. The board is seeking input from the public this evening and will make consideration to the submissions received prior to the passage of new education development charges bylaw. The Hamilton Wentworth District School Board will likely be giving final consideration to the passage of an EDC bylaw at a public meeting which is scheduled for the evening of August the 25th, 2014, and we welcome your input this evening. The agendas for this evening's meeting have been posted on the website and copies are available here. We will begin with the prof, uh, policy review public meeting, followed by the public meeting for the proposed bylaw, as I stated above. The consultant will make presentations in both meetings, and members of the uh, public will then be invited to address the board. So, if we could commence with the policy review meeting with the presentation by Lydia Dallop 
of the, uh, of the board's consultant, Amoresco Asset Sustainability Group, Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you. If we can do this. Before I start on the EDC policy review, I thought perhaps we should do a little bit of background on what EDCs are intended to do. And I believe a lot of your introduction provided that as well. Um, <clears throat> given that we are about to embark on the potential adoption of your second EDC bylaw, um, this is really the first time that the board will actually go through the full EDC process, which includes a requirement under the Education Act of a um, policy review public meeting. So you currently have the bylaw in place for the city of Hamilton and it does fall under the uh, authority of the Education Act and the associated regulation. Um, the EDCs are imposed on new residential and non-residential development where applicable. In the case of the city of Hamilton, you do have EDCs on both res and non-res development. The funds may be only used by the board to acquire lands needed to address growth-related accommodation pressures in areas of new development. And the eligible costs include not only the acquisition of the land, but also the costs associated with preparing the land to make the site building ready. An EDC bylaw has a maximum term of five years. If adopted, your proposed bylaw would come into effect on August 31st, 2014. Your current bylaw, which is about a year old, actually has a term of 14 months, and that is partly because, it is primarily because, the Coterminous Catholic Board had a five-year bylaw in place at the time that the current bylaw was adopted last year on June 22nd. The background study, which is a requirement of the Ed Act and the regulation has been produced and it is available on your board's website for anyone interested in uh, reviewing it. The current bylaw structure, the considerations that we looked at prior to adoption and which are currently in place is that you do have the ability to adopt a jurisdiction-wide bylaw in other words, one set of EDC charges throughout the city of Hamilton, or you have the ability to adopt an area-specific bylaw. In, for example, you could have a, an EDC bylaw in place that covers on the mountain and another one off the mountain. The monies collected, however, in one bylaw area, so if you had multiple bylaws in place covering your jurisdiction, monies collected in one area could not be used to address growth-related needs in another area. So it does limit your flexibility. And as I said, the existing background study was undertaken on a jurisdiction-wide basis. There are only a couple of area specific bylaws across the province and that is because growth was contained to a smaller city area of a board's larger jurisdiction. When we deal with the second policy item, which is the recovery of net education land costs, all bylaws in Ontario are applied on the basis of 100% recovery of the net education land costs over the long term, no more, no less. So you're actually collecting exactly what you've been identified as needing to collect. Based on the changes in the funding model at the, in 1998-99, you no longer have access to the tax base to supplement any shortfall in the EDC collection. And capital allocations from the province are generally not available for land if a school board is EDC eligible because the EDCs are a source of funding to be able to support your growth-related needs. With respect to non-statutory exemptions, we have in, based on the Ed Act and the regulation, certain exemptions that are considered, considered statutory. Non-statutory exemptions are any exemptions that the board decides to put into the bylaw that is not covered by the statutory exemptions. 
The problem, however, with that is that you cannot make up the shortfall created by non-statutory exemptions through the future EDC. You would actually have to find another funding source to do so. And as you know, your funding envelopes are rather limited and have pretty restrictive uh, uses on them. In general, EDC boards do not include non-statutory exemptions in their bylaws, specifically on residential. The portion of the net education land costs to be covered from residential versus non-res development. In the legislation, no more than 40% of the total costs may be recovered from non-residential development. You have the ability to apply a 100% cost recovery on residential, and then you could do it incrementally up to only recovering 60% from res, 40% from non-res. Most of the EDC bylaws cover between, recover between 10 to 15% off of non-res. And one of the problems with having a charge on non-residential development is that with economic downturns, business tends to go up and down, and as a result, new commercial construction may slow down to the point where it impacts the collection, the component of the collection that you are looking to recover from non-res development. Your board currently collects 85% of the total amount needed from residential development and 15% from non-residential development. That is also consistent with your coterminous board. A differentiated EDC. The legislation allows you to apply an EDC, a uniform charge, on all types of residential development, or you can apply a variation of that charge on different types of residential development based on dwelling unit types. So in other words, you could have a charge on medium density that is different from low density that is different from high density. The problem there is from the perspective of development, low density will often end up with a charge that is much higher because it's fewer units picking up the, low, the higher cost. From the perspective of the school board, it doesn't really matter whether you're going with a unique charge that is uniform across the jurisdiction or the differentiated charge. At the end of the day, you are recovering exactly how much you are supposed to be recovering. Demolition credits. The legislation provides for, and this comes back to the statutory exemptions that I was referring to earlier. In the Education Act, you do have certain statutory um, exemptions dealing with generally um, residential units or non-residential units that have been either destroyed by fire or demolished. In that case, because the buildings were pre-existing, based on the size, if they rebuild within a period of two years for residential and five years for non-residential, an EDC is not applied to the new construction. Your bylaw does stick to the actual requirements of the legislation, so you have a two-year time frame for res and a five-year time frame for non-res. If they are outside of those two time frames, then at that point, the EDC is applied. Conversion credits. Conversion credits, while there's no legislative provision specifically dealing with the conversion use, it is generally applicable in most boards' bylaws if they have a residential and a non-residential EDC. The reason for it is simply that if the land is rezoned and a new building permit issued for the redevelopment, so it goes, let's say, from residential use to non-residential use, then there is a calculation that's applied to determine whether or not a percentage of the EDC dealing with the new type of development should be applied and collected on the new building permit. Generally, boards will put in a time frame on that. So if the decision was made to rezone, it was zoned residential and the building permit issued and the EDC paid on it at that point in time, if they changed the use and zoning within 18 months, according to your board's bylaw, then the conversion credit would apply. If it is outside of the 18-month period 
and they've changed the zoning, then at that point, 100% of the full EDC on, let's say, non-res would then apply. The bylaw term. The maximum term is five years, and that provides significant flexibility for school boards. Your current bylaw, again, as I said earlier, is a 14-month term, and it has more to do with the fact that there was a pre-existing bylaw of the coterminous board spreading over five years. So the maximum that we could, based on legislation, stretch your bylaw was 14 months. Both bylaws will expire on August 30th, and new, new ones are proposed to come into force on August 31st. Now you also have the ability to amend your bylaws or pass new ones earlier than necessary. And generally boards will look at amending their bylaws if they find that land costs are increasing and the charge is not keeping pace with the increase in those costs. You will find that when we're dealing with identifying sites that are calculate are included in the calculation of your charge. We also ensure that it is consistent with your board's capital plan. That way there is justification that you can put forward to developers if necessary to say, yes, here's the need for the school, and yes, here's the need for the site. And that was taken into consideration at the time that the current bylaw was being developed. Two things that you did not have to deal with last year that you had to deal with this year is a review of the availability of any operating surpluses that could be used to reduce the future charge. That is a requirement of the legislation for you to look at whether or not there are available funds in other envelopes that you could use to reduce the new EDC. So a report was brought to board and the decision was that there are no funds that could be taken from other accounts into the EDC account to reduce the charge. The other policy that you're required to look at is the alternative accommodation arrangements policy to see whether or not there are any partnerships that could lend itself to reducing the number of acres that you would require go forward and thereby reduce the actual charge. And at this point, you have no partnerships that could help you in that particular situation as well. The last issue that you have to look at is whether or not after these two meetings, this meeting and the successor bylaw meeting, depending on what issues may arise, whether you would need to conduct a further public meeting to discuss the ongoing issues. And this is just a matter of the next steps. We did meet with the Hamilton Halton Home Builders Association twice on April 15th and on June 5th to discuss the EDC background study and the findings. We're on June 16th right now and we're in the policy review meeting. The next one, which will follow shortly, is the successor by law public meeting where we will discuss the findings of the background study leading to your proposed new charge. And then on August 25th, at that point, you would be considering whether or not you wish to adopt a new bylaw. Thank you. Questions? Yes, thank you very much. This is the opportunity for trustees who have any questions on this matter. Is that uh, Trustee Hicks? Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Through the chair, could you go back to number 10, please? Sorry. I don't think they have a 10. Yeah, slide eight is the last Just one. Just a slide before that. Okay, there. slide seven? Yeah. Oh, point number 10. Is there, I'm sorry, is there a timeline on once the board enters into a, a, an agreement for land or possibly buildings, is there a time lim limit for that for the charge? Example would be if we were to enter in with the city, as an example, just an example, of building a, a high school with other uh, city plans for their, for their development, would number 10 click into that model 
and if so, what would be the timeline through the chair? Mm -hmm. Okay, a um, little bit vague, so I'll give you a very broad response. We would have the ability in the next round of EDCs, so five years hence, to reconcile through the EDC account based on, um, let's assume this partnership that you're talking about in the existing background study we will be discussing, it was a matter of acquiring 15 acres of land. Because of the partnership, if the 15 acres suddenly dropped to 13 or even 10 acres because somebody else is giving you the other five with respect to the full usage, then in the EDC account reconciliation, there will be recognition for the fact that the cost of acquiring your component of the land was less than what was calculated based on the appraised value today. So in point of fact, it may result in a reduction of the future charge. And I'm saying may because we don't know what five years hence the new development would look like and the number of future sites to acquire would look like. Thank you, through the chair. That, that answers the question, if we were to share land of their building here, our building there, the total land package. What would be the case if we shared a building? So one building would sit on a piece of land and in that building would be shared facilities. How does, would that affect the EDC? The building component does not affect the EDC. The question I would pose to you is whether or not the totaled footprint, so let's assume I'm still playing with 15 acres, whether or not you fully own the 15 acres or whether the 15 acres is shared between the two. It's an ownership issue of the land. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Trustee Orban. agricultural land and there are services that are required and does that enter into any agreement with regard to EDC charges for example are the services our responsibility as a school board or the um, owner of the land it's their responsibility when we buy the land it could be both However, servicing the land is also an EDC eligible cost. It comes back to the first slide in my presentation where I talked about the total education land cost is not only the land acquisition, but the costs to prepare the site. So all of the servicing included in it. The reason I have the question to the chair is because you said in other areas you did mention the language service, and that's what concerns me. Yes. Yes, uh, Trustee Johnstone. Um, I'm just wondering if we could flip back to uh, number three. And would we happen to have information on what percentage of um, current monies come from uh, not for profit or affordable housing units? Would we have that kind of breakdown at all? No, no we don't actually have that breakdown. The EDCs are paid at the building permit issuance stage to the City of Hamilton. So however they provide the reports on the building permits, and generally it's provided based on um, number of apartment units for which permits have been issued or low density housing development or whether it's a mixed use development. Um, but I don't believe that you get the information on whether or not it is affordable housing or not-for-profit identified in there. The yes, uh, Trustee Johnstone. Just a follow-up question, would we be able to get that information? You could specifically ask the City of Hamilton for the information. It just depends on how they track that information. Yes, Daniel. Through you, um, through the chair, uh, 
As part of our report that will be coming back to board prior to adoption in August, um, there will be a report on not-for-profit housing. Um, it was part of the approval process when we approved the last round of EDCs, so that information, um, we continue to work with the city to dig through it and to summarize it and to put some sort of uh, quantifiable um, numbers behind it, and it'll be part of the agenda package for prior to adoption of the uh, bylaw in August. Thank you. Yes, I wonder if I could ask a question then. Um, in terms of moving forward in August uh, to actually um, have the motion uh, that would uh, create the bylaw, uh, and you may have said this, and I apologize if I didn't pick it up, but will it then be a five year length of time yes, from that time on? Yes, it will be a five year maximum term by law. And will we then uh, need to uh, revisit that every year or is it only to meant to be revisited um, under the circumstances where something's um, uh, misaligned as you said earlier or at the end of the five year period? We do have language in the bylaw that allows for a review of the EDC account. So looking at the cost of land acquisitions and the increase in the deficit in the account to determine at a staff level whether or not they wish to bring it forward to the board for a review or for a bylaw amendment. In legislation, you have the ability to amend on an annual basis. Thank you for that. So we are now um uh, concluding the policy review public meeting, I would uh, be happy to have a motion from a trustee that would receive as information the EDC policies oral report from our consultant and also receive as information the verbal presentation. Oh, sorry. Let me just step back. Um, before I move to that motion, um, I did earlier in the uh, meeting indicate that we would do the policy review first. And then uh, if there was anyone here uh, from the public who wishes to um, uh, speak to the policy review, that this would be the time for them to do that. Not seeing anybody in the room um, uh, wishing to speak on the issue, uh, that I then now We'll ask for a motion from a trustee of the board to receive the information regarding the EDC policies, uh, oral report, and also, re um, um, and I think that's it then. Sorry, that would be the motion. Yes, uh, Trustee Glauser, thank you. Seconded by Trustee Orban. Any, f any further discussion to this uh, motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is uh, unanimous for those in the room. Thank you. In other words, for those who are here. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll now move then to the second uh, meeting that we uh, are um, obliged to conduct, and that's the uh, public meeting concerning the proposed successor EDC bylaws and the background study. So I call this meeting to order. And I note uh, again that uh, regrets are from Trustee Pell, Turkstra, and Trustee White. Again, I ask the um, assembled trustees as to whether there is any declaration of conflict of interest regarding matters before them. And again, I will be asking uh, our consultant, uh, Ms. Uh, Dallop of Amoresco Asset Sustainability Group, Inc., to make a presentation on the proposed education development charges bylaw. Sorry. Um, through the chair, just prior to Lydia coming to the microphone, uh, just very quickly, trustees have a hard copy of the uh, background study that was handed out uh, during the last meeting. It's purposely put in a binder just in case there are any amendments. It's a lot easier to slot in than a, uh, a bound copy. Also, just handed out to trustees and all the information will be, the background study is already posted on the website, but both presentations this evening have been handed out in hard copy and will also be available on the board website first thing uh, tomorrow morning. So for the second part of our presentation. 
If I could just in terms of process uh, before we move, um, I, I guess we'll do the presentation first and then uh, call up our legal counsel um, for um, the text of the, the draft text. Okay, thank you. slide of this package is exactly the same as what you saw as the first slide of the policy review document. And seeing that we have no new members of the audience in place, I propose that we just pass over this slide since we've been through it already. Okay. Thank you. So starting on slide three, as I said earlier, EDCs are used to acquire land for growth related needs. But prior to being able to adopt an EDC bylaw, a board is required to meet at least one criteria of two set out in the uh, legislation. Either the board's total five-year average daily enrollment exceeds, and this is projected enrollment, exceeds the board's available capacity or available permanent space on either the elementary or secondary panel jurisdiction-wide or the board must have a deficit balance in its EDC account in the area of the current EDC bylaw. In the case of your board, you meet the trigger on having a deficit. Your current deficit in the account is $2.67 million. This particular slide is a representation of Form A, which is found in the background study. And what it shows is a comparison of your available permanent space at both elementary and secondary and the projected five-year enrollments at those two panels. You'll see that you have more than enough available space at elementary currently and a little bit of space at your secondary. However, based on the reconciliation of the EDC account, the expenditures that you incurred between June 22nd of last year, and um, I believe we closed this off in April of this year, um, you do have a deficit of $2.7 million sitting in the account. This amount, this deficit, is also part of the calculation of the charge. So we have to continue to try and recover the deficit. It is included in recognition when we're calculating that charge. So I thought I would start with what the proposed EDC looks like go forward. What we are attempting to recover is $60.2 million in total growth related net education land costs. So again, that is site acquisition and site preparation slash site servicing costs. Of that amount, based on your current by law, which recovers 85% on residential and 15% on non-residential, we applied the same approach on the future calculation. One, it gives you an apples to apples comparison on what you currently have versus what is being proposed. So 85% of the 60.2 million would be recovered from residential. And the total number of net new residential units is 50,292 over a 15 year period. The proposed residential charge is $1,017 per residential unit. On the non-residential side, we are looking at recovering 9.02 million or 15% of the total 60.2 million from non-res development. And we're looking at a projected 23.4 million square feet of non-residential gross floor area over the 15 year planning horizon. This would result in a 39 cent per square foot of GFA charge. If the board proceeds with the adoption of a new EDC bylaw in August, then that coupled with the same approach with the Catholic Board, the total EDC for the City of Hamilton would be 1,902 on residential and 73 cents on non-residential square feet of GFA. The 
timing, the location, and the type of residential development are all critical components of the overall EDC process. And that is because of the link between the residential units coming online and the number of students resulting from those new developments. We have used every effort to include the most current forecasts, growth forecasts available to us. We've worked with getting information from City of Hamilton staff. We've taken their development charges growth forecast, which was developed in part for their DC, uh, their development charges proposal, and that was done back in November 2013. We've also used the Greater Golden Horseshoe growth forecasts going out to 2041. This was developed in November 2012, so it's a little bit of a time gap, but it's still relevant. And we've also compared it to the growth-related integrated development strategy, the GRIDS forecast, that the city has on, on its uh, website. It is dated May 2006, but it did allow us to at least look at the forecasts for relevance to make sure that we had a comfort level on where the growth was going to materialize or is projected to materialize. This slide, which is probably easier to read in your hard copies, it is part and parcel of the background study. It's form B and C. And what it actually provides is the projection of net new dwelling units by, um, by type. So we're looking at singles, medium density, and low density. Low density being, sorry, medium, single, medium, and apartments, high density. Based on legislation, we are required to net off a percentage of the total forecast to allow for recognition of the de demolitions of individual units. So what we talked about in the previous meeting about statutory exemptions. So what we've done is we've netted off approximately 3% on medium density to recognize that uh, exemption. So we went from a total number of units of 50,772 down to 50,292. And I kind of walked, talked my way through slide eight before getting there. But I will say that based on the net number of units, the 50,292, we looked at what your total pupil yield would be from this type of uh, development, singles, medium, and apartments, and then determined what your board's share or yield would be based on an elementary and based on a secondary panel. And we have the ability to compare not only your board, but also to look at the historical information for the Catholic board to make sure that the apportionment was relatively in sync. We then also looked at census data, looking at both the 2006 and the 2011 census periods. And what we did find for the city of Hamilton that overall, not just your board, but also the Catholic board and other service providers in the area, the elementary school aged cohort or children and the secondary have been decreasing over time. However, the number of zero to three year olds has also been increasing and it has increased slightly by about 2.3%. So that, so in other words, you've got a cohort of zero to three year olds who are about to enter school at the JK level. That coupled with development projected over the 15 year horizon from the 50,000 to 52 net new units would result in a projected increase at the elementary level of 15.4% in your enrollments and 2.3% on the secondary enrollment panel. <clears throat> and what we did there was we compared what your projected enrollments for 2014-2015, which is the first year of the period of the 15 year period would be, compared to the last year of the 15 year period, which is 2028-29 to determine what that impact and change would look like. Now just to step back a minute, <clears throat> the legislation, although the bylaws are a maximum term of five years for any EDC, 
The charge is actually calculated by looking at a projection of need over 15 years. And that's where that 15 keeps coming in. So we do look at the long-term need and the legislation allows us to also identify outside of the five-year period where future sites would also be needed in order to pull that into the calculation of the current charge. Now what I thought I'd do was give you a comparison, seeing that it's only been a year since the last bylaw was adopted, to compare what's in place today versus what we propose to have in place in August. So the charge that we are proposing is $1,017 per residential unit compared to the previous or the current charge of $1,040 per residential unit. That's a difference, a decrease of $23. On the non-res side, your current charge is 40 cents per non-res square foot of GFA. That would drop by a penny to 39 cents per non-res square foot of GFA. You are, however, over the, the future charge, looking to, to collect 60.1 million in net education land costs compared to what you are looking to collect today, which is 52.2 million in net education land costs. The differences that has resulted in that decrease in the charge is primarily because a year ago, we were using a growth forecast in place prior to the updated information that the city put out in 2013, in November of 2013. The number of units in other words, the divisor of the charge back in June of last year was 42,708. Today, the projected number of units is 50,292. Similarly, on the non-res side, last year we were looking at 19.6 million square feet of GFA. This year, the projection has changed to 23.4 million square feet of GFA. So again, those divisors, ugh, sorry, I'm renting the mouth today. The divisors are much higher on this proposed charge than they were a year ago. And Ms. Uh, Dallip, would you like some water or? No, I'm fine, thank are you. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> now, as we talked about it in the previous presentation, you have the ability to apply up to 40% of your total cost recovery to non-res. And what we've provided, and it is provided in the background study as well, in the cash flow analysis, is a sensitivity analysis of what that charge could look like if you are looking at recovering 5% up to 40% through non-res. What's been highlighted is what we are proposing in the background study, which is that 15% of the total amount to be recovered, be recovered from non-res. So you could end up, if you decided to go with 100% res, you could end up with a charge as high as $1,196 per residential unit, no impact on non-residential, or a charge as low as $718 per residential unit, but a significant impact of $1.03 on the net gross floor area on the non-residential side. Now we get to the site sizes. Um, <clears throat> this extract is taken directly from Ontario Regulation 2098 regarding EDCs as amended, where they provide site size maxima. However, they also provide for potential flexibility on a board's part to either acquire a site that is slightly larger than the maxima or smaller than the maxima. And it really depends on you providing some sort of justification, especially in the case of excess land, of why you need a slightly larger site. Often the case is that you've optioned a site and the acreage is slightly larger than the maxima because that's what's available to you or it's in your site plan, or you've actually acquired it. <clears throat> now, 
Now, in assessing the growth-related accommodation needs, your board's jurisdiction was subdivided into 17 elementary and six re secondary review areas. They are simply planning constructs so that we could look at need within those areas compared to the schools that are already existing in those areas. And, and of course, this resulted in the identification of some communities where there's insufficient space to accommodate growth-related needs and resulting in new sites. As a result, we're looking at acquiring over the next 15 years, 10 elementary sites impacting six review areas. So there are six where there are significant growth pressures to trigger the need for the sites. The total acreage is 61.67 acres, of which 53.91 acres is EDC eligible. And that is because in some cases, we have sites where only a percentage of it is growth related and the rest of it is existing needs. In other words, those students are here today. The total growth related new pu net pupil places that we're looking at overall is 7,796 elementary and 2,684 secondary, of which you have some space available in your schools to accommodate some of those students. So what we are looking to accommodate is an estimated 5,128 elementary and 1,115 secondary students in new schools on these sites. That translates into about 65.8% of the elementary need being accommodated on these new sites and 41.6% of the secondary need being accommodated on the one site. Now when I compared that to what we had a year ago, a year ago we were also looking for 10 elementary sites, one of which has been acquired. So we've added one to the entire package. And we were looking a year ago for two secondary sites. We are now looking for one, because I understand that the other one has already been acquired. Your board worked jointly with the Catholic board to acquire the services of Boyack and Associates Limited to do the site appraisals. As a requirement of any EDC study, we look for the most current appraised values of sites. Your board identified five sites that they asked the appraiser to take a look at. And the values, the land values came back in a range of between 550,000 per acre to 800,000 per acre. These are serviced sites. The appraiser's report, because we also asked him to look at what he believed would be a reasonable percentage increase on these land values as we move further and further away from 2014, 2015. And we call that the land escalator. So he provided, based on economic markers, he determined that a 5% escalator over the next four years would be reasonable. So we applied that to any sites to be acquired beyond 2014, 2015. And we capped that escalation to the last year of this bylaw term. So even though the site may be acquired in 2022, the escalation stops within five years so that it does not shoot the cost artificially high. We also looked at site prep costs and escalated that to 2% per annum to the identified year in which the site prep is going to occur. So unlike the acquisition costs where escalation stops at the first five years, the site prep goes to the year of acquisition. So if year of acquisition is proposed to be year 12, it escalates it to year 12. Reason I'm raising this is because last year when we looked at developing a background study, we determined that given the short term of that introductory bylaw of 14 months, it would make more sense to not escalate any of the land values <clears throat> or site prep costs at that time. So there were no escalators built into that charge. And when we look at an, an analysis of the $60.2 million that we need to recover, 
what you'll find is that based on land values, the site acquisition costs make up 69% of the total charge. That does not include the escalator. The escalator is a 17% increase on the total charge. If I take you down to the very last row, you'll see that the deficit, which is also being recovered and is part and parcel of that 60.2 million, you will see that that percentage of the charge is actually only 4.4%. So again, you've seen this slide before, so again, it's just the timeline to say that after this meeting, the next meeting to, for you to consider this would be your bylaw adoption meeting on August 25th. And that's it, but at that time, that's not it. At that time, prior to adopting your bylaw, you will require the Minister of Education's approval on your enrollment projections being reasonable and the number of sites Okay, and that's one of the reasons why that background study is sitting with the Ministry of Education right now. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, final clarification. Uh, this is an opportunity for trustees to ask questions on the matter of education development charges background study or the proposed successor bylaw. Yes, Trustee Orban. My question, and it's due to my naivety, um, Madam Chair. <coughs> So we're talking new, new areas. My question is, the, if the board is in the process of uh, uh, selling land and also the buildings will be demolished, what happens? Do we pay back or how does that go and okay. fit into the big picture of things? Within the EDC legislation, if you purchased land with EDCs and you turned around, and this should not happen until maybe 20 years from now, but if that happened and you sold the property with the school on it, okay, then the value of the land, so the revenues you receive for it, must go back into the EDC account. To date, you've purchased one elementary site with EDCs and let's assume, and this is a broad assumption and just an example, let's say five years from now development shifts and you decide, you know what, that site is not in the area we want it to be. We're gonna go out and buy a new site and we're gonna put this one up for sale. The one that you purchased with EDCs, you must put that money back into the EDC account. Okay, and when we do a reconciliation, anyone doing the reconciliation every five years, would not only look at the expenditures incurred, but would also look at any, what we would term proceeds of disposition impacting EDCs that would offset an increase in the charge. However, if you've previously, so let's say the decision was to sell a piece of land with a building on it that you did not purchase with EDCs, those funds go into your proceeds of disposition reserve. They do not impact your EDCs. Yes, uh, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you, through the chair. Um, this report was completed at the end of May and at the end of April, the city had approved 15,000 new housing units for Winona. So I'm wondering if those new housing units were included in this report or if they have yet to be added. Those housing units are included in it. At the time that we picked it up, it was still projected. But as a projection, like anything else, once they approve it, it just gets more certainty, but it has been included in the forecast. Thank you. Yes. I'll, I'll have to go back and look, but I know that it was originally uh, projected for 21. Um, so 15,000 would be significantly less. We were actually um, having discussions with staff at the city of Hamilton, and one of the areas that we were specifically discussing with them was Winona. Okay, so it may not be the exact 15,000 and whatever that they approved, but it was pretty close. Okay. Any other questions? 
Uh, this is uh, now the time to ask if there's any member of the public who wishes uh, to come forward to uh, speak uh, on this matter regarding the proposed bylaw. Not uh, seeing anyone uh, rising, I then uh, conclude the second uh, public meeting and look for a motion from a trustee to receive the information from uh, Amoresco Asset Sustainability Group uh, on the Education Development Charges Background Study. And also, sorry. Okay, I think we've gone out of sequence again, my, or rather, I don't know why we included the royal we I went out of sequence, thank you very much. Um, I believe I'm to be inviting, is it Mr. Giavadonai? Yeah, that was, <laughs> through you Madam Chair, it's close. Um, but what I will, I'll speak on, well Mark will make his way up, but I think uh, Lydia discussed a lot of the content of the bylaw. And the one clause that differs uh, from the last go around is our ability now to amend the bylaw in midterm. Um, which is something that we hope to review and exercise over the course of the next five years to ensure that there's no excessive jump either way in the bylaw when it comes up for renewal in five years. Um, will Mr. Giavadoni be, be speaking, addressing us then? Yes, thanks. Through you, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, there's really very little left to say. Uh, the proposed bylaw itself um, it, it's uh, virtually identical to the existing bylaw, but for the, uh, the, the charge amounts will uh, likely differ in accordance with the background study. It is for a five-year term as opposed to the existing one, which is uh, only for a 14-month term. And uh, as uh, uh, Officer Del Bianco has mentioned, is uh, uh, a right to revisit the, uh, the studies and the, and the charges throughout this five-year term. Uh, Really, those are the only uh, the only uh, true changes in the form of the bylaw. Thank you. So then, uh, back to um, my requesting or uh, welcome to receive a motion from a trustee receiving this information from uh, Amoresco Asset Sustainability Group, and also to receive the information um, from uh, ESB Lawyers LLP. Thank you. Uh, uh, Trustee Johnstone, do I have a seconder? Trustee Simmons, all those in favor? Uh, I am pretending not to see um, Trustee Turkstra. She is not actually in the room. Uh, other, otherwise, we are carried unanimously, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset, these, are, these two meetings uh, have been held for the purposes of reviewing the current uh, EDC policy, making sure that the public is aware of our EDC process and, and what is being proposed as the bylaw, and if it was, if, and to give the public an opportunity to speak if that had been uh, necessary. So I wanna thank everyone very much for that, and I look for a motion to adjourn this public meeting, which is concerning the proposed um, successor EDC bylaw in the background study. A motion to adjourn at Trustee Johnstone, seconded by Trustee Hicks. All those in favor? Thank you, uh, that's unanimous. And uh, we'll take five minute recess before we begin our next meeting. Thank you.
trustees could please uh, take their seats. I want to welcome everyone to the board meeting for Monday, June 16th, 2014. Um, and I want to um, call the meeting to, to order. And I would ask, as we do at every uh, board meeting, uh, if we could all rise and sing, O oh Canada. And I wonder if we could have the current student trustees lead us in O oh Canada tonight. <laughs> One of the great privileges uh, as chair and perhaps even just as a member of the Board of Trustees is to welcome two new members to our table. And I am thrilled and delighted to welcome Rakshan Cameron, who is a grade going into grade 12 at Westmount School, and Hannah Tobias Murray who is a student going into grade 11 at Westdale, who are new student trustees for 2014, 2015. I welcome them to come down and be introduced to us all. Wonderful. Now, this is not yet your, your first formal meeting, but you will have a very formal task to do. We're about to, I'm about to, I, by some authority vested in me, I don't know how, but I'm about to give you an oath that you have to swear to. Did you know that? No. <laughs> well, welcome to the life of being a student trustee then. And what we, we can, uh, I can say it, you just fill in your own name as you repeat it after me, okay? I have been selected by my peers. Now let's do it, let's, maybe we needed a rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> let's start again. I will say the words, you fill in your words after I repeat the words, so repeat the words after me. I. And then give, give your names, please. Have been selected by my peers. Have been selected by my peers to represent okay. the elementary and secondary schools of Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. The elementary and secondary students of Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Do solemnly swear that I will respect the rules of protocol and conduct of this board. That I will respect the rules of protocol and conduct of this board. Will represent students to the best of my ability. Will represent students the, to the best of my ability. Will present the best interests of students for the benefit of the board. Will present the best interests of the students for the benefit of the board. 
and will serve as an advocate and representative of the Hamilton District School Board at all times. And will serve as an advocate and representative of the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board at all times. Thank you very much, Hannah. And we'll get you to sign your declaration, and Rakshan will get you to do it by yourself now, too. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi, Rakshan Cameron. Having been selected by my peers. Having been selected by my peers. Do represent the elementary and secondary students of Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Do represent the elementary and secondary students of Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Do solemnly swear that I will respect the rules of protocol and conduct of this board, that I will respect the rules of protocol and conduct of this board, will represent students to the best of my ability, will represent students to the best of my ability, will present the best interest of students for the benefit of the board, will present the best interest of students for the benefit of the board, and will serve as an advocate and representative of the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board at all times. And will serve as an advocate and representative Thank you very much, Rakshan. We'll get you to sign your name, too. And ladies and gentlemen, the Board of Trustees, your two new student trustees for 1450. One of the other annual events that occurs at this time of the year has, has a bit of a festive and celebratory tone to it, but also a little tinge of sadness as we say farewell to our old student trustees, to the student trustees of 1314, and of course, that's Carly Van Egdom and Philip Suzik. tremendous work that Carly and Philip have done. Of course, they've represented the voice of the students uh, from our board here around the table, and they are all, have also been co-chairs of the Student Senate. They both sat on the City of Hamilton's Youth Advisory Council. They supported the local activist group Mentor Action in raising awareness about gender-based violence. They helped recognize community volunteers at the Hamilton District school board's profiling excellence events. They spoke to elementary and secondary student leaders about the importance of student voice and the role of Senate. And they've promoted community involvement as HWDSBs at the social justice fair. They also led, and I had the opportunity to see this for maybe about a half an hour a month ago, and I know that our director of education, Mr. Malloy, was there as well. But Carly and Philip led the entire Student Senate in providing over 120 students from our school board with the opportunity to attend a very special conference that um, promoted mental and physical well-being among youth across the city. They worked with the Senate, they teamed up with uh, St. Joseph's healthcare staff and put together a very exciting, very energized uh, conference. So congratulations to both of them for doing all the work that they've done, um, but also very specially for the conference. They've also, but of course they had nothing else to do, so they were, have also been very active with the Ontario Student Trustees Association. They, uh, and through that association, they're the voice of two million students in Ontario through their roles as communications officer, Ontario Student Voice Award representative. Tremendous amount of work that both of them have done on our behalf. Um, here at the board and here through the, and throughout the province. I'm very excited to say that uh, Philip will continue to work with us though over the summer on the Focus on Youth um, youth mentorship program, and then he's off 
in September to Queen's University where he'll be studying commerce. He looks forward to getting involved with student governance once he arrives in Kingston. I think I have a friend who's the vice chancellor. I think I better warn him about your coming. And he plans to pursue postgraduate studies in either business or law. I look forward to uh, hiring you to run my business or to defend me in criminal court. But thank you very much. Uh, Carly will be returning, as she's done a number of summers, as a student ass assistant at the Dunbarn Medical Group. She'll be taking your blood pressure, uh, doing some patient pre-screening, perhaps doing a little bit of lab work, and general clerical work. In September, she's heading off to McMaster University, and she'll be studying in their arts and science program, planning to major in molecular biology and genetics. And then, surprise, surprise, she hopes to attend medical school. So our future is in extremely good hands with these two young people, just as the last year of student leadership has been in tremendous good hands with Philip and Carly. here and I apologize if I didn't catch everybody but I believe Carly your your mother and brother are here is that correct mother and boyfriend oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> that would be Jake yeah. okay sorry Jake <laughs> and if they could just uh, stand as well <laughs> and And um, Philip, did did you bring any family or crew for you? Everyone's working this evening. Well, that's good for them. Well done. <laughs> and then I know that the Tobias uh, Murray's at the back. Uh, there's a few of them. Um, Mr. Murray, Ms. Tobias, and Benjamin, who I understand is going to be the valedictorian at Sir William Osler next week. So thank you, all three of you, for coming. And Rakshan, we're now your family, so welcome here. Wonderful. Thank you all. And then for those of you who may not recognize her, may, may in fact have forgotten her completely, I do want to point out another very, very famous student trustee, former tr student trustee, who I believe now represents the grandmother of Philip and Carly, being a couple of years ago. But Susan Tian, who is a very active member with the, Ontario, with the Alumni uh, Association for the Student Trustees of Ontario. Susan? <laughs> the student trustee program leadership has been something for all of us to watch of the last 10 years. Uh, I have been really impressed with the caliber of student leadership. Uh, also been very excited to see how welcomed and embraced the student trustees have been by the, wo the ward trustees. I want to thank those who've given rides, those who've given advice, the table mentors, uh, Alex and uh, Tim currently, I think Todd was a table mentor at some other stage, uh, a student trustee mentored, uh, extraordinaire, uh, Trustee Johnstone, thank you for all your good work working with the student trustees. And I also want to give very strong recognition to uh, Superintendent Prendergast for his work in uh, uh, supporting the student trustees of the Student Senate and the, his staff and other wonderful people who have helped to make that work. I want to thank you all. And none of this would occur, of course, without Heather Miller. Now we have gifts. First, how do we do this? It's just, I'm just going to yell. I'm just going to yell. Okay, I'm going to yell. Okay, I'll come get you. You two come up. Come, come, come. Come, 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 come. come. <laughs> trustees, Dr. Seuss's, all the places you'll go. 
and we treat it like a yearbook, like a high school yearbook. I don't even know if they have them in book form anymore, but we're still old school. So um, to Philip, from all your friends around the trustee table and the executive council, and to Carly, from all your friends at the executive council and board table, to both of you, thank you so very much. I hope you keep that as a souvenir. And I understand one of the trustees from last year took it with her to university this year. So I didn't have teddy bears for people, but the yearbook will have to do. And then we, we still are um, uh, being given some generous uh, accommodations by the city of Hamilton. Uh, but I, so we do not have our big fancy student trustee plaque for you all to see and for you all to see how it's all nicely laid out with your names on it. But we will have that and get you back to look at it. In the meantime, I have a plaque just to acknowledge the good work that they've done and the outstanding leadership they have both done for us. That's to Philip Susick and Carly Van Egden. All the very best. Oh, the places you'll go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now go to the approval of the agenda. You will, you will know that uh, there are a number of different pieces that have come down to you. They'll be in the yellow, uh, in the, the yellow hard copy. You'll see that it is a revised agenda. So I look to a motion to, for approval. Trustee Glauser, do I have a seconder? Trustee Johnstone, thank you. All those in favor? One order. I oh! <gasps> and uh, you really are going to bring something to Kingston when you get there There's on student problem. governance. <laughs> well, let's let, let me at least get the motion and then we'll go back to you, okay? Um, so all those in favor of the agenda? Thank you. That's uh, carried as uh, unanimously. And having missed uh, your spotlight, I will now, yes, I can see Carly's very upset. I will now go back to our student trustees for their final report. First and foremost, once again, thank you very much all those here today is much appreciated. I'll now move forward with the Asta Eco report and give a synopsis of this year for Asta Eco. It was Asta Eco's pleasure to award students for their hard work this past year with four through four scholarships for four deserving individuals through the Ontario Student Voice Awards with which Carly was involved. In addition, Asta Eco worked to better the way we are educated through our OSPES survey. Asta took steps in reunifying Aust Ontario Student Voice the creation of the French Board Council who work with the French students across the province to tighten our ties with them. In addition, OSTA hosted three successful conferences where there was more representation from school boards than any other prior to them. In addition, through these conferences, OSTA was able to increase the breadth of our professional development as student trustees. OSTA met and collaborated with provincial stakeholders Asta created two provincial-wide publications, The Echo and Our Voice. 
Ostaco was able to increase student awareness about Ostaco through our Thunderclap social media campaign, which impressively reached over 260,000 students. Osta was successful in introducing four position papers, which officially stated Osta's stance on matters affecting students across on Ontario. And lastly, but certainly not least, Osta gave that back to the community through various social outings and contributions. As a whole, I'm proud to say that Osta had a successful year this 2013-2014 school year. And looking back at Rakshan and Hannah, I'm confident that moving forward, it will be just as good as any other. Thank you. And then I'll be doing um, the local report. Uh, Jessica kind of just summarized what we've done this year, but um, recently schools have just been winding down the year with lots of year-end celebrations and carnivals as well as school closure events. Um, Student Senate is uh, also looking to have a year-end social sort of get together just to close off the year and um, maybe do a pool party or something like that just for some fun before everybody heads off for the summer. As well, Philip and I will be training Rakshan and Hannah, our new two student trustees over the summer and helping to um, introduce them to the position and just give them an introduction to what being a student trustee looks like. As well, I'd just like to thank you all for helping to support me this year. Um, it's meant a lot that you've all been here and um, just aided me when I needed help and uh, listened to all my concerns. I've learned lots about the education system and learned lots of leadership leadership skills through this position and I've thoroughly enjoyed this year. It's been a pleasure working with all of you and uh, it's really instilled in me a love for education and I'm sure that will last a lifetime. I just wanna thank you all for being excellent role models of leadership and um, just really showing your own love for education and the dedication that you show in your role is just so meaningful to me and um, I just really appreciate all that you've done this year. Thank you so much. Thank you both, and I know uh, uh, exams are screaming at you tomorrow, so um, we would, uh, we would um, be sad to see you go, but uh, we know you have to leave early tonight, so uh, thank you both very much. All the very best. Uh, so, back to the approval of the agenda. Uh, we have uh, any declarations of conflict of interest regarding the agenda as you've received it now? Okay, not seeing any then, I'm looking for a motion to confirm the minutes of the special board, May 26, 2014. Um, Trustee White, do I have a seconder? Trustee Orban, thank you. Any commentary? Uh, okay, all those in favor? And that is carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, motion to confirm the board uh, minutes of May 26, 2014. Thank you, uh, Trustee Glauser. Uh, seconded by Trustee Hicks. Can I do that, Mr. Hicks? Thank you. Um, any commentary? Uh, not seeing any. All those in favor? And that is carried uh, unanimously as well. We then come to item seven under correspondence. This is a, a document uh, that uh, the Ontario Public School Board Association has drafted regarding the EQAO tests and um, recommendations that uh, the, uh, the association has made regarding this. I do understand that uh, Trustee Bishop would have been involved in a program committee uh, at the OBSPA level. I suspect uh, Trustee Johnstone uh, was involved uh, as well, and therefore uh, they perhaps more thoroughly than the rest of us have had a look at this. Um, but if there's anything you would like to um, suggest for changes or revisions that we might give OBSPA, please let me know. Yes, uh, Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, obviously, I was reading through this. It was uh, I was um, really, really pleased with uh, the the response and some of the concerns and some of the the positives and negatives and what they're planning on doing on a go forward. I just was a little bit taken aback when it said that the survey was circulated to all board members, including all trustees and senior staff. 
I don't remember ever receiving this through you because I certainly would have made comment. You're, you're not the only one who, who it seems uh, not to uh, have gotten it. Uh, so let me check into that. Um, and very often uh, this circulation comes directly from OBSPA itself. So maybe uh, for once they didn't quite do it that way. So let me check with that. Well, we certainly get a, a lot from Yes, OBSPA. I know, yeah. So when I saw this, I was just surprised that, because that would have you know, gone onto my radar. Yeah. But I do want to appreciate um, the discussion paper. I want to appreciate the people who took the time to actually respond to it and uh, certainly look forward to uh, some changes. Yes, uh, Trustee Jacob? Madam Chairman, I believe we're being asked to endorse this. Yes, so I would be happy uh, to receive a motion to endorse it if that is where people would like to go. I'd yes. be happy to do so. Thank you, Trustee Bishop. Do I have a seconder for that? Trustee Orban? Any further conversation? Yes, Trustee Bishop first. Madam Chairman, there was not unanimity uh, across the board. There were large degrees of, of, um, of opinion, those who were opposed to uh, EQA and those who supported it, and, and those in the middle who wanted to see changes. And I believe the recommendations um, that have, ha, have emerged from, from this very broad discussion, which certainly I've attended, I think, three different um, events um, related to this, this particular document, um, I think reflect the range of opinion, the, the concerns are, um, from both one extreme to the other, and the recommendations, I think, are ones that are useful and would be helpful, in, and that we, I think, regardless of where people stand, could all support. So, Madam Chairman, I, I'm happy to, to move this. Thank you very much. Uh, Trustee Orban as the seconder. Well, I read through this carefully, and I especially like the uh, page 7-11, the conclusion remarks. And uh, I, I felt, Madam Chair, that this was forthcoming because there were many questions associated with EQA re results, and I think some teachers felt there was more to evaluating students than just through this particular document. Obser um, observable behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So this, that was highlighted. So uh, it is a pleasure that I second this motion to review the data, which is always very significant to ensure Thank you. Um, yes, Trustee Simmons. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, you know, to my relief, it looks like the pendulum's finally starting to swing the other way, and uh, this might be just the, the beginning of it. You know, especially, I think this may be uh, drawn on largely because of uh, the changes in 21st century fluencies and, uh, and how uh, standardized testing in 21st century fluencies don't really mesh, uh, especially when you're teaching to individual children and giving everyone the same test is not uh, a lot of sense to some people anyways. So anyways, I'm happy to see the pendulum is starting to move, shift the other way and we'll see where it goes. Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of endorsing, uh, just uh, uh, as an operational element, I would follow this up with a letter saying that we have in fact, if, if, it, if this motion does in fact pass, that this is what occurred tonight at this meeting. So, uh, to the motion moved by Trustee Bishop, uh, seconded by Trustee Orban, all those in favor? And that is uh, unanimous. Thank you very much, and thank you for the commentary, and we will, we will look into uh, how this didn't get to everybody individually, as they seem to have claimed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, We're now come to the point in our agenda Well, I'm looking for a motion to move to private session to discuss an item related to se section 2072 of the Education Act related to the disclosure of financial information in respect of a member of a committee. I ask for a motion to move into private session. Yes, Trustee Simmons, a seconder for that. Trustee Turkstra, all those in favor? 
and that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much uh, to the people in the audience. I can see some people have been here before, but this is the point at which uh, we uh, need to have private discussions, so we ask that you uh, please leave and just wait outside in the hallway. Thank you so much.
we are resuming our meeting. We are now at item 10, reports from standing committee. So the special standing committee of June the 2nd, 2014. Ms. Uh, Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move the report of the Special Spanish Standing Committee from June 2nd. There is one item on the report, which is the East Hamilton Accommodation Review Decision. The decision was broken down to uh, four parts. A was in the East Hamilton Arc that the Board of Trustees approved the closure of Woodward and Rocks Park in June 2015, the adoption of the boundary map. B was the minim minimum investment of $4 million. C was the post arc boundary reviews, and D uh, was that staff report to the Board of Trustees regarding the unused space at Ballard. Madam Chair, once again, I'm happy to move the report. Do I have a seconder for the report? Yes, uh, Trustee Johnstone, any commentary? Yes, Trustee Mahalo. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, last week I said a few things on this, not supporting it. Uh, I don't think I impressed too many people. So tonight I'm just going to uh, present, read the email that the trustees all received today and just touching some of the parts. I, I believe maybe some of the trustees never read it because they're scheduled, they have a busy schedule. And I feel that my words went this way, maybe this way. Uh, to our elected school trustees, after the school trustees meeting on June the 2nd, many of us involved in the ARC process were left baffled as to what had occurred. And when we are left with more questions than answers, we now understand that a trustee can put forward their own plan, but, that, but, does, not, but does not just negate the entire ARC process. How can an option be put forward, voted on, passed, when there has been no public discourse, debate, or explanation, what is the purpose of the art process that if one person could come in at the last hour and disregard all the work we as a committee volunteered 35 plus hours, work that took us away from our families to jobs, work we were not compensated for in any way other than the satisfaction that what we did was the best for the children in our community. Maybe the options presented to the art we're not endorsed by all. It would have been likely that it had been our recommendation. We did have the option to request a moratorium, moratorium all closures. If we could have, it likely that would have been our recommendation. Lack of endorsement from one trustee does not mean another should come in and endorse something that 18 community and school representatives knew nothing about and one that many of us do not support. In fact, 50% of us, possibly more do not. We do not understand how some information was available to one trustee, but not the art committee making the recommendation. We feel that it's important for further consideration be given to what the art committee recommended as a two school option, rather than what a trustee for one school out of representing one school out of seven recommended. We fear that many of you were not provided with the proper time or information to compare what the ARC presented or what the trustee presented, especially to what we feel was an underhanded method to bring in a proposal. Not all community ARC members or trustees were made aware of this plan in advance. Some clear, clearly were as they pre were prepared with laminated posters to hold up. We find this method of proposal a little bit disturbing, disrespectful, and clearly demonstrate that we were purposely omitted because we would present an opposition. As we could see from the trustees' question on the ARC website, there is no indication of a proposal by a trustee. The only information available to the public was the questions that were being asked. There is no contact provided of where these questions originated. If our own trustee was not aware of this plan until the Monday morning of Monday, June the 2nd, this would indicate that many others or not, especially the public. It appeared that many trustees 
felt a two school closure was appropriate compromise, rather the unfathomable of all unrealistic option, nothing. Many of the art committees also felt this way, which is why we included a two school option. One that was heavily debated, scrutinized, and voted on by all 17 present ARC members. Both options we presented were split evenly with votes, which is why we presented two options, not just one, and why we agree not to rank them in any specific order. Again, making it unclear why the trustee presented a different two school option. And down at the bottom, it just says a four million, I'll just, I'll, I don't want to run over my five minutes. Uh, they do. The art committee received transportation numbers on two se separate occasions, so it's unclear as to why uh, the trustee Simmons numbers were uh, not available to him. And as you see, one minute. One minute. And chair Woodward. And as you see, the comparison chart provided Woodward said that would be bus increases from 36 to approximately 90 percent. This is based on transportation estimates provided by the school board staff on November 14, 2013. And this is just an estimate. There's also a huge safety concern rather than filling Ballard with students from Parkville, which was the initial recommendation from both the board and the ARC. Ballard will now possibly house strangers. How is this acceptable without input from the Thank you. Um, any other speaker to the motion? Yes, uh, Trustee Turkster. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I've been receiving a few of these, as we all have, on, um, I guess, the disappointment, uh, in their words, almost shock that, you know, we went ahead with, uh, I guess, the, the hybrid plan. And I started looking through all of my notes, and I could see that this was, this plan was forming long before uh, it came uh, to the board. We, we had the opportunity every single week for the trustees to ask questions. And Trustee White asked questions every single week about what does this proposal look like? What does that proposal look like? What would the enrollment numbers look like? So the one that was brought forward, we have all of the data in our ARC package, in the ARC questions, and I have it here, but I don't have the date, and it shows the closure of those two schools, Woodward and Rocks Park, and what it would look like, and uh, I believe that, I believe that, you know, the community is upset by this, but this is, this didn't come at the 11th hour, according to my notes. It is in the record as being considered for trustee option, and I guess what um, I guess what is is difficult about ARCs is that the ARC committee puts forward their recommendation at the end of January to the director, and then we go through the cooling off period. We've been getting emails throughout that entire time. Uh, we then hear from all of the delegates, from all the different ARCs. So since January, and you know, listening to delegates and whatnot, we do go through a process where sometimes we've changed our minds. And it has happened in the secondary ARCs, and it has happened in the elementary ARCs. The only ARC that we have right now where we actually took the actual staff recommendation was the Central Mountain. The rest of the arcs were modified. So I'm sorry that, you know, things get modified and you feel like we didn't respect the arc process. For me, I feel like the arc process was respected and that things change sometimes after January. So I'm going to support the motion because I don't think it was an 11th hour Let's just go with what Todd says. This was well thought out by the ARC, and it was also well thought out post-ARC committee. So, Madam Chair, I'm going to support it. Uh, any other speakers? Um, I did have the motion uh, 
Moved by Trustee White and seconded by Trustee Johnstone. Uh, Trustee Johnstone, did you want to speak uh, to the motion? Um, as I said at uh, the standing committee meeting, is I, I st still believe that this is a compromise, and uh, I think that as trustees, we try to do our best with the with the situations that we're we're given. Um, as I had stated in my earlier speech, we're under tremendous pressure from the province to to uh, get rid of empty people spaces. We all know that we have over 5,000 empty people spaces uh, in this board that we're trying to to uh, um, alleviate. Um, at the same time, though, we have our communities that want walkable schools. They want to keep their community schools. So we are doing the best to, to find um, a solution, and I stand by uh, this proposal. I still believe it's the best compromise. Thank you. Um, yes, Trustee Orvin. Madam Chair, I will support the proposal. However, the part that bothered me somewhat is there was, a, on my part, a feeling of post-arc um, issue to be resolved, and that was the boundary change. And, um, for example, I believe that that was a post-arc decision as to be handled at a later date. And that bothered me somewhat because the other arcs weren't, uh, shall we say, looked at in the same way. No post arc. We thought we did the arc itself, but it didn't happen that way. So although I will support the compromise, I just thought you should know that I didn't really appreciate the post arc direction, the second part of this particular. Thank you. Any other speakers? I then go to the mover, Trustee White. No? Um, to the motion, moved by Trustee White and seconded by Trustee Johnstone. All those in favor? Uh, Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Orban, White, Brennan, Johnstone, and Simmons. Those opposed? Trustee Bishop. Trustee Maholland, the uh, motion is carried. Thank you. Move then to standing committee, uh, June the 9th, 2014. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to bring forward the standing committee report from June 9th, uh, June 9th 2014. Uh, there were a number of items on this agenda, in particular item number three, the Central Mountain Accommodation Review which saw through A, the closure of East Mount Park in 2015, Linden Park also 2015, and Cardinal Heights in June 2015, and uh, the reorganization of grade level for Queensdale. And part B was that Hill Park and Linden Park property not be sold until a new South Mountain site is owned by the board and services are secured. The next item on the agenda was the Finance Committee report. Uh, which recommended uh, that it be uh, uh, received. That included the secondary school revitalization strategy that's being recommended for approval. And uh, that would be the la last action item on the agenda, Madam Chair. So I'm happy to move the report. Thank you, Trustee White. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Hicks, thank you. Any uh, commentary? Trustee White, did you want to speak to any of the items? Uh, I know you're presenting it as a report from the Standing Committee itself. Trustee Hicks? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor then? Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Orban, White, Brennan, Johnstone, Simmons, those opposed? Trustee Bishop, Trustee Mahon. Thank you. Uh, we then go to um, Committee of the Whole from earlier this evening, June the 16th, uh, again to Trustee White. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to present the report of the private session of Committee of the Whole held earlier this evening, a couple moments ago. The committee considered a private report from Standing Committee June 9th, 2014, which included a human resources report from May 20th with updates on personnel matters, and also an approval of the Finance Committee report from May 28th with respect to the disposition of property at Parkside High School and site. Bellstone Elementary School and site, as well as the approval to complete property transactions while the board is in summer recess. In addition to the committee report, the following recommenda recommendations are being brought forward tonight as well. The approval of the audit committee report from April 10th in respect to updates on the audit schedule for 2014-15 and the reappointment of the external auditor for the 2013-14 fiscal year. Also, the approval of the audit committee report from June 5th in respect to an update on the audit schedule changes for 2013-14. Madam Chair, I'm happy to move the report. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Glauser? Commentary? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. We now go to uh, the special standing committee for May 26th. This was an item um, that is on yellow, I believe, for your consideration, uh, 10D-1. And this is the West Flamborough Accommodation Review item. Uh, if I, again, can go to uh, Trustee White. Thank you again. This is the Special Standing Committee report from May 26th. There, uh, the main item is the West Flamborough Accommodation Review. The recommendation has two main parts. The first part, uh, considering the uh, closure of Beverly Central and Dr. Seaton in June 2015, and a new 350 pupil place school built on the Beverly Community Center. There are also other additional changes within part one. The second part of the motion concerned the closure of Greensville and Spencer Valley in June 2016, and also build a new 350 pupil place JK-8 school on the Greensville site and further uh, information is available under that part. Um, and then lastly, um, we did discuss trustee our questions that evening for information. So Madam Chair, I'm happy to move the report. Do I have a seconder for that? Trustee Turkstra? Any uh, further commentary? Yes, Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Obviously, uh, very happy to be the seconder for to move this report. And uh, should it pass tonight, uh, Councillor Pasuda and I attended the Property Liaison Committee meeting uh, to talk about the partnerships um, and their viability. And that committee um, requested that uh, should it pass tonight that the uh, chair of the board send a letter to the mayor's office, clerk's office, um, at your earliest convenience, uh, requesting that the partnership proposals in the motion be presented to council for their approval to investigate for viability. Um, and I guess they couldn't emphasize enough, uh, the sooner the better, so that um, we can start. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So very happy to move um, uh, to, to second and with the letter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, operational uh, nudge. Thank you very kindly. Uh, any other commentary to the, uh, uh, the yes, Trustee White? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to comment uh, on this particular arc, and, and I think some of the same trends are, are in the other arcs as well. And that's the amount of work that went into these type of recommendations. I think there was a lot of creativity in this round of elementary arcs. It's never an easy process, and it's certainly difficult to stay positive and try to make as many people happy as possible while, while making tough decisions. So I, I do want to thank the, the trustee for this area and, and I'm very impressed by how the trustee works with uh, the councillors and many of our valued partners. Um, I think it's that type of thinking outside the box that really brings to life a lot of our accommodation review decisions. And as Trustee Turkster mentioned earlier, um, very few uh, mirrored the very uh, first staff recommendations. So we did see the process work in one way or another. 
Uh, and as a result, we have uh, what I would consider three very valid options in front of us. So I want to thank uh, the trustee for the area and everyone involved in all of the arcs. Thank you. Uh, trustee Hicks. Uh, through, you, through the chair, the comment by Trustee Turkster with the, the letter going to the city, uh, would it be prudent for the trustees to direct the chair through to the director that we initiate a conversation as well? I mean, uh, to direct our staff once the city handled it to then enter into official uh, agreements with the city during the summer? So if that's the case, I would, I would direct the uh, chair to do that with the director. Thank you. Um, I, I think in, uh, Mr. Director, did you have some commentary on sort of the operational process? Should this motion pass this evening? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If the motion passes this evening, I would assume, unless I hear otherwise, that then not only would you send the letter as described, but that I would reach out to the city manager. Thank you to the motion then, moved by Trustee White, seconded by Trustee Turkstra. All those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you very much. I do also uh, want to note uh, the attendance of Councillor Pasuda. My apologies for waiting. Uh, we were sort of celebrating student trustees somehow, and we, uh, it, uh, I apologize for waiting so long to mention your attendance. Thank you very kindly. Um, we then go to the reports from special committees. Technically, you should share. Yeah. So, um, since I'm chair of the program committee, I believe the vice chair of the board uh, best received my report. Thank you, so I'll go to the chair of the program committee, uh, which is the chair of the board, Trustee Brennan. Thank you very much. Uh, we had our second uh, program committee uh, meeting. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, a small but mighty group, uh, Trustee Bishop, uh, Trustee White and myself, uh, with um, strong involvement and, and excitement by Executive Superintendent Pam Reinholtz, so it's, we're quite the team. Uh, we uh, spent quite a bit of time looking at the program strategy um, update, a very thorough uh, process. I hope you have had a chance to read uh, through it in terms of the transitions that are occurring at various uh, schools and also um, uh, uh, thoughts and, um, and intentions and commitments uh, for how the transitions will follow through in September as well. Uh, there's also um, documents inside the, the full report on um, closing ceremonies and um, how that uh, is proceeding. So uh, that was one thing. And then uh, we did have a discussion um, about some of the uh, material that this body, the Board of Trustees, has talked about around French immersion. Uh, but uh, we will have some more discussion when we meet again. So that is my report, Mr. Chair. I move that report. Thank you, Trustee Brennan. Are there any questions on the program committee report? Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It certainly was uh, an excellent read. Uh, I just had one quick question about it, and that was on 11-7. It talks about... Um, uh, my path my way and uh, the new 7 to 10 brochure a guide for families to help navigate through high school was distributed to families Did we get a copy of that no I don't believe oh. we did I, I apologize uh, mr. chair I, I maybe we best go to the staff to double check that the director Yes, to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, may our trustee officer comment on that, please? Okay, it, it appears it can and will be provided. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you. you very much, and uh, thank you for the report. Thank you. I did fail to get a seconder. Do we have a seconder for the report? 
Trustee Bishop, thank you. Are any further questions on the program committee report? See none, all those in favor? That is unanimous, thank you. And I'll give the chair back to Jessica. Try not to steal all your papers. Yes, <laughs> So um, we are now at item 12 uh, at the policy committee for um, June the 9th, 2014. And I go again to Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. The policy committee met one final time last week on June 9th. The only item on the agenda was the volunteer policy. Uh, the committee heard a delegation from the Hamilton Wentworth Principals Council. Uh, took a number of uh, pieces of information into consideration and requested to see the policy back in a revised format in the just fall. A, just a minute, um, uh, Trustee White, I think there's some uh, concern about the document itself. Yes, what? Trustee Hicks? Item 11, the program committee. It's part of the entire report. Program? Yes. Yeah, the whole. Did you have um, specific questions within that document? In the secondary enrollment, I did, and I've already tried to get some answers. Uh, from can I? Can I ask? Can, we'll go back. Okay. Let's, because we're in the middle of policy, so let's finish policy, and we'll go back and ask your questions. And um, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Trustee Hicks. Trustee White, I'm sorry for the interruption. Not a problem. Yeah, so just to summarize briefly, the only item was volunteer policy. We've received the delegation from the Principal's Council, and we'll see a revised policy back in September. Uh, so I do move the report for information. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Glauser? Any other commentary? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. Uh, let's uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, and yes, for the uh, committee report from program committee, the report itself is 11-1, but all the um, uh, material uh, was included after that. So it is quite a, a large document, but uh, I'll go to Trustee Hicks uh, for his questions or commentary. Through the chair, and thank you for the consideration. On 11-17, Appendix E, uh, we're doing the uh, summary of secondary enrollment. And uh, the first grouping of schools with Noah Henderson, Barton, Hill Park, and McNabb, it has the actuals for Barton and Hill Park and McNabb, and then it has projections for McNabb. I wonder if the staff uh, tonight, if not, they could uh, get it to me, tell me how many students from Barton went to Nora and McNabb and Hill Park to McNabb and Nora. What, what, what was the breakdown of those students? I just want to be sure the question is clear. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Director? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Either we'll have it for you, or I'm looking at the executive superintendent who's nodding. She has it with her. So <laughs> she's going to have it sent to you. Thank you. OK, thank you. And we would uh, include Sher uh, Sherwood as well in that so that we now know the number of students that ended up within the triangle of Sherwood uh, and Nora and uh, uh, McNabb. If, if I could get those, I'd appreciate it very much. And my last question through the chair would be Delta. It shows uh, the actual and projected, but I'm assuming that Parkview students are in that. And I think I was told earlier this evening that 23 students from Parkview are uh, have uh, <coughs> option sheets at Delta. Is that correct? Let me check. Thank you. Uh, to the director. Through you, Madam Chair, to the executive superintendent. That is correct. <laughs> and some went to their home schools in other parts of the city. The majority of Parkview students, though, have chosen to go to Mountain for grade 10, 11, and 12. Thank you. Through the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are now, we are now on pass number 12. We are moving to the audit committee for the number 13. And I go back for June the 5th, 2014. I go back to um, the chair, um, Turkstra. 
Trustee Terpstra. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me get there. So, uh, happy to move the report. We, uh, we met on June the 5th, and um, because we're having a, uh, a year's break uh, from accommodation reviews, we decided that it was a good time to uh, put in the accommodation review process as the 2014-2015 audit in replacement of the board's attendance support program, which is going to be under a new uh, system next year. So there's no point in auditing something that uh, hasn't been fully implemented. So we made a switch of those two audits and uh, it makes sense in terms of the audit plan. Thank you. So you'll be moving the report? Yes. Thank you, uh, Trustee Turkstra. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Trustee Simmons? Any commentary, Trustee Simmons? No? Any commentary for anyone else? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. We can now come to the Community Advisory Committees. And we have item number 14, French Immersion Advisory Committee. Executive Superintendent Figueredo, I understand Portugal did not do very well today. Oh. I'm silenced again. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I heard from Superintendent Zucker that um, Germany barely squeaked by a win over Portugal. Just 4 nil was a close game. <laughs> Yes, anyway, <laughs> what I have in front of you is the, the French Emergent Advisory Committee community report. Uh, the committee met five times th this school year and our last meeting was May 28th. So I'm bringing the report on behalf of the co-chairs, uh, Denise Massey and Lisa uh, Breton. Um, as you notice in the report, there are, there are nine items, information items. There were no direct motions passed by the uh, FIAC for the board to consider. But uh, just to highlight, again, we reviewed the FI programming, number of minutes, uh, we shared that with FIAC. We had recommended resources for, for approval, there was discussion regarding that. EQAO cohort data, that, that we're looking at our grade threes, sixes and nines and tracking them, which EBS is supporting us with. Uh, discussion around the Sherwood FI, was an update provided, to let them know that their previous motion is with the program committee. Out of catchment for FTK was discussed and that our current policy still applies. Uh, FIAC was reminded that transportation policy is up for consultation starting June 1st to the end of September and the draft policy was provided uh, by the co-chairs to the rest of FIAC. New FSL curriculum was also discussed. Uh, the elementary curriculum has been uh, rolled out by the Ministry for, for beginning implementation September 2014. The secondary is not out yet but there was discussion through our consultant, the support for providing teachers with that. There was also discussion around our grade one FI uh, program in terms of enrollment and uh, transitions. Um, and then also enrollment projections, which I um, did eventually provide through accommodation planning. So that's the report in front of you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, let's uh, get a mover first. Trustee White, do I have a seconder? Trustee Bishop, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, uh, two questions. Just um, wondering if you could explain it in a little bit more in detail about the Guy Brown School Community experimenting with replacing French instruction in science in the junior grades with phys ed, drama, and visual arts. And that was a local initiative, I see. Maybe if you could just um, bring us up to date on that. Through you, Madam Chair. I have another question. Thank you. Yes, through the chair. As part of our review, uh, we put in front of the FIAC that uh, in ma that the majority of our schools, up to grade six, that the core subjects taught in French are French, math, science, and social studies as the core subjects. And then schools based on the size, uh, interests of students, expertise of staff, will dabble in some of the other subjects. Um, 
Guy Brown community in consultation with their administrators um, asked to review a possibility of, of um, meeting local needs. So they had a discussion with the community uh, and used an integrative thinking model to discuss uh, their interests and they asked if, uh, if we still met their minimum requirements, if we could explore the opportunity based on student interest and uh, staff expertise to have science be taught in English and to look at the arts phys ed being taught in French instruction. So that was uh, brought up by FIAC for discussion and um, it was shared through our consultant myself in consultation with the work we had done with the principals at Guy Brown School. Yes, so uh, Trustee Turkstra. So was that based on you know the difficulty of the science curriculum in French or to expand it across other subject areas and was it based on the data? Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Figueroa? I have the notes here from the community consultation. Uh, discussion came to FIAC regarding um, science curriculum and some concern from the uh, few guy bound parents. We provide support through the consultant to, re to review, to review even the programs that we offer, the resources. But there was also an interest to expand to more subjects where they'd say that in a more social setting, subjects that would lend themselves to more conversational French so students could apply. So they asked to uh, explore that. And there was also an opportunity with expertise of staff. So they're still meeting our requirements of instruction. So it was, it was sort of a, driven by a combination of, of both. But there was also discussion of impact, knowing what our secondary FI courses are in grade nine. We spoke that students have choice. Science in grade nine is offered as one of the subjects students could engage in. But it's not necessary to take science in FI in grade nine. So the community knew that that, that would be an impact um, for students who would then transition from Guy Brown potentially into an FI program. Thank you for that. The other question I had is, I wasn't sure on number five, the out of catchment F FDK, uh, this previous motion has been sent to the program committee to consider and it doesn't change our current process. So that is, is, it's going to be considered in the next year with the program committee only or? Well, the program committee would, um, because it came from the board of trustees to look at it, the, the program committee will look at it and then bring back um, thoughts and recommendations to this body. That would include transportation and all of the... Yes. Yes. Yes, but we'll, we're looking, we would be looking primarily at first at the French immersion side of it. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, just with regards to adjusting uh, French immersion courses and English courses, uh, what is the process uh, for a school community to uh, to actually make that change in their school where it's not sort of board wide, um, do we know what that is? Yeah, let's uh, let's ask then if we could, uh, Mr. Figueroa. Yes, through you, uh, Madam Chair. I mean, this is my first experience engaging uh, in this. So during the review we laid out some uh, parameters in terms of our system expectations, what historically has happened, and those were the, the subjects I outlined. Um, but again, this is an example of um, how flexible are we with our in intelligent expectations as a system, and the parameter was around the number of minutes of instruction. Uh, so when the community asked around science, the question that was brought back is what other courses can replace the number of minutes that science is taught in French? And um, and what are the interests of the students? And what expertise do we have staff who, in, in a dual track school who can teach French and phys ed arts? Um, so this process was engaged through school council to principal, principal reaching out uh, to myself and the consultant around engaging in, in a process and then there was a community consultation regarding it and uh, that was the outcome. So we're gonna monitor and track that piece uh, for the parents. But as Director Malloy always reminds, that we provide the parameters as a system, and then what bubbles up in school communities that we try to respond as long as we meet the requirements that we have set out in terms of minutes of instruction in French. Uh, 
Uh, the director would like to make a comment yes. and then I'll come back to the trustee. Through you, Madam Chair, just one piece to add to the executive superintendent's point. One of the things we've discussed here is that, and we will be doing this work beginning in September, is the elementary program strategy. So even though in this particular instance there are needs that have emerged from a particular community and we're certainly responding to those, we also understand that we need to look more globally at our programming in elementary, including French immersion. We need to wrestle with some key questions. We need to put thing, those things in front of the board and we will be engaging our broader system community around these things. We don't want individual schools simply to make decisions without there being, as the superintendent said, those parameters and we realize that we have more work to do with that particular strategy just as we have finished with our secondary strategy. Okay, back to Trustee Simmons and I believe I saw Trustee Bishop as well. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, I don't know if there's any talk of, of uh, math and if that's uh, math being taught in French and I don't know if that's gonna come in, in the fall as well too as a discussion because I would think there is some correlation between uh, math and French and science and French or vice versa. So I saw the nod and it seems like we're, we're right now just the cons just consulting at the moment and discussing and, and that's fine and uh, we'll see where we land. Uh, to his question, I know we received a nod but uh, um, there, there is thinking on uh, French and math. Yes. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that's where I think that even though we have this experience in this report, that question and others like it need to be brought forward in a systemic, strategic way. So, I mean, we could talk about arts and elementary, science and elementary, French immersion and elementary, but we're not ready to do that this evening. What we're promising is, is that all of that's going to begin being part of the work of next year brought before the board by the end of next school year. Thank you. I have a, a list of uh, speakers, so Trustee Bishop, then Orban, and then John Stone. Madam Chairman, I'm pleased that we're looking at this because this has been a long-standing issue with French immersion. Um, the, the problem of, of adequate instruction in French in, and in science and mathematics. And uh, uh, actually, I understood that uh, over several years there have been some schools which did not always offer French immersion instruction in science or math before. So. Uh, I think it's good that we're now formalizing this discussion, especially as if you're, th if you're thinking about the sort of outcomes and end game. Um, at, the, at the high international level, scientific papers are written in English. So, um, regardless of the country you come from. So, uh, I, I think this is a, is a good discussion. I, I think it's no way undermining the program. It's more about um, making sure we have a proper language instruction and we also are doing a good job in teaching math and science. Thank you, Trustee Bishop. Uh, Trustee Orban. I don't know whether I'm out of order or not, but uh, I think at one time um, we were talking about having a French high school. And the reason I bring that up, because when you have French um, families, both the both parents speak French, and the children do. Um, I know we're trying to be more effective in the programming side of it, Madam Chair, but will some of these people eventually have to move on to another uh, board to get what they want for their kids? Because we're taking a long time in delivering some of these programs. Now, it could be because we don't have the teachers or when we have the teachers that do very well, they go into the English speaking uh, unions. So I'm just asking that question because at one time it was uh, requested of me through Nor the Norwood Park group, when are we going to go there? And uh, is there a possibility or we're we just going to go with the dual track, thank you. To the director. Through you, Madam Chair, at this time, as the board has passed, uh, a program at Westdale continues and the program opens at Sherwood and our population uh, at this point needs to be served in that fashion and there is no um, staff recommendations for an all French immersion high school. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you, through the chair. Um, 
I was quite happy to, to read about the uh, item number four, should, Sherwood FI update, and uh, that uh, there will be, uh, staff will be generating a strategy for transition. Um, I, I'm just uh, wanting to ensure that during the transition discussions that there's also talk about advertising of uh, the program and certainly the benefits of uh, and different um, program choices available at Sherwood as well as uh, the busing option. I think that uh, communication is just <coughs> as important and um, we should be communicating to uh, about all of our new um, specialized high school majors and uh, programs across the board for all of our high schools, but uh, certainly for FI at Sherwood, I think that this is particularly important uh, to be communicating that to, to students that are looking to go there. Thank you. So those were suggestions. Uh, thank you very much that they'll be noted. Thank you. Any other comment? Then uh, to the motion by, uh, moved by Trustee White, seconded by Trustee Bishop, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Figueredo. We now go to item 15, the naming of the playground at Kathy Weaver School. Uh, Mr. Director. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm looking up to uh, Superintendent Joshua. Yes, hello, Mr. Uh, Joshua. <laughs> so, I'm on. Um, just um, through the chair, I bring forward to you a, a report recommendation from the school naming in part advisory committee to consider uh, the naming of the playground field adjacent to Kathy Weaver Elementary School. You'll see in the report uh, three recommended names, Constable Kathy Weaver, Weaver Field, Constable Weaver Field and Weaver Memorial Field. Um, all recommendations from the committee were considered um, in light of a consultation um, report that was brought forward to us, a 30-day consultation that took place from April 30th to May 30th, at which time uh, there were five respondents to that consultation, um, some names that were brought forward, and along with uh, uh, discussion with the committee, um, these recommendations were brought forward in order to honor the work of Constable Kathy Weaver, who made a significant contribution to the school and community in support for her work with youth in the area um, surrounding Kathy Weaver School. So, uh, Madam Chair, I bring that report forward to you and would answer any questions as they arise. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have a mover for the action? Yes, Trustee Simmons. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Johnstone? Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, yes, yes, I think we need a motion, uh, Trustee Simmons. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to uh, propose uh, naming the new field at Kathy Weaver School, Constable Kathy Weaver Field. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll now look for a seconder, yes. Thank you. Um, Trustee Johnstone. Trustee Simmons, did you wish to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just first off with to the report, um, I don't want people to, f I don't want the board to feel slighted that only five people responded. Um, and, you know, sometimes we impose uh, certain values on communities that have different values and different ways of communicating their interests and their ideas and their feelings. Um, and, uh, and this is a, an area of our city uh, at, at times was, was long, was forgotten by most of the city. Um, but, it's a, but it's a neighborhood that's coming back for, in many reasons, it's becoming a much more diverse neighborhood and um, the fact that uh, the importance of this field that uh, we have now created is one of the, uh, the most positive things that have happened to this community uh, since the building of 
Kathy Weaver School. Um, this, uh, the school, this field, uh, connects itself with, with Pinky Lewis. And uh, what, what we have gradually happen, happening here is that the neighborhood is, is coming back stronger. It's, it's taking uh, its neighborhood back from more negative and even uh, criminal elements um, that once was what this neighborhood was, was recognized for and seen, unfortunately, because there is a lot of great people, great kids that live in this neighborhood. And even, even the addition of uh, mission services moving into the neighborhood has gone a long way to improve uh, the, the lives of these children and their families. Uh, and, it's, and this is why it's important that we actually go through this process for this, for this school. Uh, in order that the community can take ownership of it. The reason why um, I, I have put forward Constable Kathy Weaver Field was one is for that community ownership, but the constable part of it. Kathy Weaver was a police officer. She was a police officer that uh, when nobody else was doing a lot outside of school around there, she was taking children from Sanford Avenue School. She was getting them involved in programming at Pinky Lewis. She was taking them under her wing. And, uh, and by that, she was making a difference, one person making a huge difference in this area. Um, and, uh, and so we want people to remember that she was a police officer uh, over, uh, over the next number of decades. We don't want that forgotten. We want the police to not only have symbolic ownership of this field, but also a physical presence as well, too. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've talked to, in the last number of weeks, talked to a number of, of people at the school, a number of families, and, uh, and how, it's made life, uh, how it's made a difference in the lives of those children. You go by this field now on any given day and you'll see the kids running around playing, laughing. They had nothing like that before. Um, the uh, caretaker uh, for Kathy Weaver no longer has to pick up needles every morning. Um, one of the parents approached me the other day and, and told me that a second crack house had moved out of the neighborhood. Families are moving back in uh, and uh, people from Toronto are moving into this neighborhood as well. And so um, it's important, I think, that we we celebrate this community and we can celebrate it in this way. Um, we had hoped um, that we might um, do a formal naming uh, committee this Friday um, when we have an event with, with Scots in the city as we're putting in a new- uh, One minute. Thank you. We're putting in a, uh, a butterfly garden. We're putting in an outdoor classroom. And, uh, uh, but we thought talking to the family who are 100% behind this. They have to come out from Calgary some, and uh, from uh, St. Louis, and they needed more time. And so we're gonna have, we figure if this passes, we'll have a celebration. At Weaver Celebrates on September 11th, 2014 is the date for Weaver Celebrates, and that's when we'll do the unveiling, and we'll have the family there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you, through the chair. I'm happy to second this motion. I think that uh, naming, uh, naming the field Constable Kathy Weaver Field is important because it reinforces three positive messages to the children and their families. Um, number one, uh, she's a strong female role model. And I think that it's important to highlight strong females in our communities because we, we don't always get the opportunity to. Uh, number two, uh, Kathy uh, was uh, a police officer, and uh, as Trustee Simmons just highlighted, it's important that the name Constable is highlighted in, in the naming of the field's name um, because it reinforces positive police relations. And number three, um, it uh, communicates to the children, uh, their families, and the community the importance of community service. Kathy was passionate about her community um, and it demonstrated that each person has the power to transform their community and make it a better place. That's really important uh, to, to instill that idea into our students and into the community. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other comments? To the motion moved by uh, Trustee Simmons, seconded by Trustee Johnstone, that the school uh, field be called Constable Kathy Weaver Field. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Joshua. We now come to our oral reports, and the first one is the Ontario Public School Board Association report. I have nothing further to report at this time, um, other than that we have our CSBA uh, uh, conference coming up at uh, the beginning of July. And uh, if you're not already registered, I hope you do. Uh, we will be having uh, Chris Hadfield is one of the, the keynotes, and um, there will certainly be uh, lots of important discussions happening at this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director, for the Director's Report. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it is uh, almost hard to believe in some ways that we are at the end of another school year, but I would like to offer a few comments this evening to the Board. First of all, a special thanks to um, Superintendent uh, Vicki Corcoran, who will be retiring uh, very shortly, um, at the end of next week, I think is the exact date. Of course, we bid farewell to her in a celebration recently, uh, and Chris Croxell as well, a few months before. But again, to these two uh, very uh, important members of Executive Council who have provided so much to our students and our staff and our, and our communities, I just want to offer on behalf of Executive Council to you uh, my thanks to them and do that in a public way this evening. <laughs> Superintendent Corcoran knows how much she hated every second of that, but we still <laughs> do it anyway, as she smiles at least uh, at me at this point. Some of the highlights of the past year, uh, Madam Chair, that I just want to very briefly speak to, the secondary program strategy and all of the transition work that has involved so many members of our community, our students, our staff, has really been monumental. And the piece that I believe is most monumental is that we are concretely making steps to not only build community, uh, engage our students in doing so, but also really looking at the notion of all pathways, every student's great secondary schools. And again, there's a lot of work to be done, but plenty of work has happened this year that is setting the groundwork for all that's to come. We learn from the work that we do and we have learned a lot from the process of transition, and that's been really profound this past year. Transforming Learning Everywhere is something that this board has given uh, approval to, we bring forth every year, but we're transforming how our students learn, how our teachers teach, and we're doing it by looking at each student's passions and strengths looking at how teachers provide many opportunities in the learning environment, and all of this accelerated by technology. So it's quite exciting, and there'll be much more work to come. As our board is aware, our math strategy has been working very diligently to focus on what it is that our students need the most in order to be successful. We hear a lot in the newspaper about the discovery or inquiry method isn't good enough. The back to basics movement is where we need to go. We've been putting forward a balanced approach where we do need the foundational skills and we understand that, but we also need to incorporate those 21st century learning skills, the curiosity, the creativity, the innovation, the problem solving. So we are trying to do both and we're working very diligently on that. And lastly, a highlight from this past year I want to underline is our positive school climate work. Building strong relationships in every school, integrating mental health, equity and inclusion and safety is again work that is foundational to our students' well-being and achievement. And as we look to next year, a year without accommodation reviews, thanks to this board's motion, allows us to consolidate significant work. Full day kindergarten is in all schools and our early year commitment remains strong. Everything that I mentioned as a highlight of this past year must remain a focus for next year. And we will continue to work diligently with you in that. So as we close this school year, I want to first say on behalf of myself and Executive Council to our Board of Trustees, 
The amount of nights and, and important work and meetings and subcommittees and ARCs and all the rest uh, have been phenomenal this year. It's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to work closely with you, and we're very, very grateful for that. For our staff across HWDSB, who continues to excel and do great things for our students, to our families and communities who, without them, we could not be successful for our students, and lastly, and most importantly, and I'm sorry that our student trustees had to leave, we're only here because of our students. That's the only reason we do this work. We work with you very closely. We're thankful to your leadership, and we wish you uh, all the best this summer as we take a little bit of space, hopefully some downtime, as we continue on next year with plenty of important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the chair's report, I, I primarily uh, want to thank the community. I think one of the biggest challenges this year um, for the community has for us to put before them some tough realities that we as a board of trustees have been facing and managing and that we continue to uh, manage through. And West Glanbrook, West Flamborough, East Hamilton and Central Mountain all came to the table to look at the reality facing the board and to look at how do we still best provide quality education to our students in um, accommodations and in facilities that honor and respect their, their involvement and their safety. The amount of hours and, and thought and time that uh, individuals have put into it, including staff from our uh, schools involved in each of those uh, ARCs, um, and community members it is just absolutely unbelievable. And, and the only way to make even good decisions possible have to be very involved people looking at everything and coming up with all the suggestions that are possible to come up with. Recognized earlier tonight, and we've received emails um, over this time, that there are people who are disappointed in decisions that we've made. Um, and understand that. Um, uh, the, the ARC committee's work um, is tremendous, and it finishes at a certain point in February or March. And then uh, the staff and the trustees and the community in more general ways and delegations all came in to give us more information, uh, different perspectives and different things to consider. It is all a part of a piece that moves us finally to a decision. So thank you to the community for all of that. Thank you for the community for all of the work we ask you to do when we want you to look at our processes, we want you to look at our procedures, we want you to look at our protocols and tell us how can we do it better, how can we do it uh, deeper and more involved. So I wanna thank the community. I also want to thank all the trustees around this table. Um, Mr. Malloy has just discussed all the many hours you put in and time you spend with your school communities as well as with the rest of us pouring over um, documents and, and, and moving forward on many different uh, things. And maybe not everyone will uh, acknowledge all the work that individual trustees do. But I personally want to thank you for all your committee work, your school work, your involvement with um, your constituents in terms of their problems and concerns. I also want to thank you um, for one of the toughest jobs there is in, um, in trusteeship, and that's the expulsion committees, listening to issues of discipline and trying to make good decisions. I know we're involved in lots of different other things, but I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart, the tremendous amount of work you all do every day, every week, and every month. To the staff, um, and it's everybody. It's everybody in the schools. It's everybody um, in, 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 who's a teaching staff, people who are keeping our uh, facilities safe and clean. Uh, it's absolutely everyone. But the people I see all the time uh, in real in real time, in real circumstances, are the members of executive council. The people I see all the time helping us uh, work through uh, as liaisons on our various committees, 
bringing us their best thinking uh, are, are the members of executive council. And then of course, um, people whose titles we'll never get right, such as Daniel De Del Bianco, um, Ellen Waring, um, Jackie Penman, Heather Miller, Tracy McKillop, who constantly help me anyway, and most of us to get things right. And I cannot in a thousand days say enough about the thanks to the members of Executive Council. And I cannot begin to thank John Malloy, whose leadership, devotion, absolute passion for doing the right things for all our students and making sure that we're all somehow engaged in doing it together. I, my admiration for you is now public. It's finally out. I just have no choice. I've just said it here. But I am just thrilled and delighted, and I wish everybody a wonderful summer because, gosh, we're going to need your energy. September is only eight weeks away. <laughs> anyway, have a great summer. Thank you all very much. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Trustee Glauser. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Simmons. All those in favor? Yay. Thank you very much.